the name of our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to Large Glass. Welcome. It's our 13th episode. Lucky 13. Lucky 13. I have a feeling it's going to go swimmingly. I think it will go very smoothly. Hi, Audrey. Nice to see you. Hi, Audrey. <laughs> your one and only visitor in the so chat room. So far, you're it. So, yeah. Well, wait a minute. The nope. There's Sergeant us. Spider. I haven't seen you in a while. Hello. How's it going? And Dave. And Dave. Hi, Dave. Good. Cool, cool. We're adding up. This yeah. is nice. This is great. I'm excited. We got an awesome show tonight. We do have an awesome show. I mean, I, I think we have an awesome show. I think so, too. Good. Good. I like so, how it's all related. How are you guys doing? Anything new out there? Tell us about your week. I want to know. Because I met, you know what? A lot of people didn't come on Sunday. It's okay. I cried alone while I made a drawing with Amanda and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were good company. And both of them had headaches. And they stuck around. Huh. It was nice of them. That is nice. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, there's mom. There's there she mom. is. Thrilled for good Thrilled vaccine for good news. vaccine news. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, a little Agreed. bit of hope. Yeah, yep. that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I keep saying it's like line me, sign me up. I'm, I'm there. Yeah, I'll jump in. So uh, let's see. What do we have to talk about? We've got a few things to start us off. Wait, there's Amanda. <laughs> Hello. Sorry to hear you had a bad headache too, Chris. Oh. Yeah, I, I learned that from her after the fact. So the two of you were doing double duty headaches on Sunday. So. Um, so what do we got? Let's see. The usual. Last week's show. Last week's show was last really week's show. good. Yeah, yeah we people, had a really good time on People that. were talking about it all week long, so they were going back and watching it and coming back to us, so yep. that was really cool. Yep, and we also, um, so last week was Sketchbook Spin. It's a kind of a new variation on the show where we looked at the sketchbooks of three artists, and mm -hmm. we were really lucky to have one of those artists in the chat room with us. So that was, number one, um, a little intimidating. Uh, and number two, really kind of helpful because he was commenting and we were talking and then when we got off you were like I want to call them on the phone because I feel like I need to tell them something well I just wanted to touch base because I've never done that before I've never you know we've never had an actual artist on right. the show to kind of go over his artwork so I just wanted to touch base and make sure everything was good and it was it was awesome we were on the phone with him for a little while, a while afterwards, like a half hour. yeah, kind of going over everything. So that was that was really good. And then I got a text from him the following day or two days later that said, "Hey, I just wanted to thank you for that show. I really got invigorated to get back into the sketchbook and and try and get in there every single day. And it felt so good to hear that. Yeah. So you inspired another artist. That's well, awesome. I mean, that's yeah. what we want this show that's to be about yeah. is to just kind of like you know get people motivated. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. I don't know how motivating today's show is in terms of making. Um, I think it's. I think it will be. There's. I feel like we're going back to roots a little bit with this one. Yeah. Just because we're gonna we're gonna touch base on things that normally we don't talk about. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's okay. We're we're not gonna tell you, of course, who it is. Although it, no. it did pop up in the. Uh, it, it, it pops up on the title of the show, so it's not like it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So a couple of other things. We have a new member of our team who's going to be joining us imminently, not actually on the camera right now, but behind the scenes we have Mr. Andrew Schialo, who is going to be doing some really important publicist work for us and mm -hmm. writing for us. So we're thrilled, Andrew. I'm excited to have you on board. So thank you so much. We're we're looking forward to working with you. So uh, so we should be able to, we should toast him. We should. So should we open tonight's we drink to and we can toast our, Andrew? Our beers. Okay, so tonight we have beer for our large glass. Yes. And tonight's beer is Sam, Sam Adams, Adams from Boston because tonight's- Yes, all of that. Hock the con, have it, yeah. You gotta do that. <laughs> I have to. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is very fitting. I was, so. you know, I was gonna do my own Boston accent, oh, but now gonna? I'm not going to. Why not? Because you got it. I don't want to. I don't want to go over the top for, of you. That's yeah, not fair. There's room for more accents. We could do this all night long. Well, I could tell a Boston, a quick Boston story while I'm opening. Okay, this. go ahead. And that is, if you go to Boston, and you're looking for a place to have dinner, and you want to eat in a really good restaurant, just about any honest person for Boston, if you say, "Hey, 
where's the best restaurant to eat? They're gonna say, well, if you don't mind a 45 minute drive, it's in Providence. Hmm. Because Providence, Rhode Island has the best restaurants so it's not even in, in that area. It's not even in Boston? No. Okay. No, the best restaurant in Boston is in Providence, Rhode Island. I know that firsthand. Well, I think, because I went to Boston once or twice, and I ate a, a restaurant called, it was the Prue. Like, you eat on top of the Prue. It's the Prudential mm -hmm. building. That was pretty cool, because you have yeah. the whole, uh, you know, landscape of the city all around you. Oh, and I'm not saying Boston doesn't have any good restaurants. Yeah. They certainly do. Mm -hmm. But if you want the best food you gotta providence, go to rhode island providence <laughs> is unbelievable for yeah, food yeah oh, absolutely. absolutely so should we toast to episode 13 episode and to 13 andrew and andrew. To andrew thank you for joining us we're excited to have you yep. and uh cheers it's exciting cheers boston boston all right all right so there's that okay. um what else do we have to talk about well um we could talk about glenn oh yeah we could talk about glenn we talk about Glenn all the time because we're trying to get to 10 subs, right? 10 subscribers. And when we get to 10 subscribers, we have a piece of art to give away, mm -hmm. which we're thrilled about. Yeah. And I think I should keep telling this. I think I should keep saying this like maybe four times in an episode instead of just once. Maybe. But Glenn Lavertu, and some of you have already subscribed. And thanks to the subscribers out there. We really appreciate that. Ah, uh, Barry Boy's here. How's it going? Hi. Hello. Um, uh, we really appreciate the subscribers that are out there, but if we get to 10, we have a piece of art to give away. And so I want to We just completely lost our feed. The whole thing crashed. <laughs> 13th episode. Yep. Are you guys out there? 13. Can you hear us right now? Are we here? We're, We're back. back. Yes. yes. Thank you, Amanda. Thank yeah, all of a sudden, the whole entire broadcasting software just vanished. It's the 13th. It's the 13th so episode. Hopefully, that's the end of the glitches, but... I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. We're gonna bring. We're gonna try and very carefully bring Glenn back up because we were talking about him, and all of a sudden everything went bonkers. That's an ominous sign. It's gonna be one of those nights, everybody. I have a feeling it's gonna be one of those nights. Can you see us? Are we here? <laughs> oh well, that's good. Berry Boy says that we have 29,000 viewers, so maybe that's the problem. Yeah, we're back again. Good. Thank you, Amanda. All right. I think I know what's doing it. There is a glitch in the connection to that slide of Glenn's. The problem is, is I've got to get past that slide of Glenn's to get to all of the other side. So um, we'll figure that out. We'll keep talking for a little bit. Anyway, Glenn was generous enough to give us a piece of art to donate on this show. We're going to give it away at 10 subscribers. And um, why wouldn't you want to subscribe to a broadcast that, you know, crashes and fails every 30 seconds? I mean, I think that's an excellent <laughs> idea. Not everyone can offer you that. It's the 13th episode. This has to happen. It is. Right? I'm sure it's not <laughs> <laughs> Mike Raider's here. All right. All right. Good to see you, Mike. Dave cool. says we're back. You went out three times on my end. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Three times. Berry Boy is testing out the chat. Don't worry, you're here. It's, it's working. working. Um, yeah, Good. we had some problems. I think there's some kind of internal glitch. Um, what happened to me today is every single icon on my desktop totally vanished and went to the cloud. And I couldn't find my files. And they don't even show up, not just on the desktop, but in the folders. So um, I'm having a little freak out over that. But I'll, I'll figure that out. I'm not too worried. So. Anyway, the point was about Glenn's work is if you'd like to support the show by donating a small piece, we'll put you in that subscriber sort of hopper and we'll use you as a goal. Mm -hmm. And if we get to like 20, we'll yeah. talk about you every night until we get to 20. And that would be great for all of us, I think. So we yeah. can work on that a little bit further. Okay. Um, all right. So enough of that. Enough of that. Hopefully that will be the last crash. Now, I do have to get back to that slideshow where Glenn's thing is, so I'm going to have to do some maintenance you while know, we're working. I'm wondering if we can actually just post a picture somewhere <laughs> so that people can look at it and we don't jinx the whole thing again. I will fix it. Don't worry. Okay. I will fix it. Okay. All right. All so, right. anyway, um, we were talking about last week's show. One other thing I just wanted to mention really quickly mm -hmm. was um, we had talked a while back about buying art and buying you know art for the holidays and for gifts. Yep. And uh, today, I managed to, um, oh, there's Carolyn Thau. She's like, are you live now? I think you yes. are not. Yeah, we, we were on and off a lot, Carolyn. We had some technical difficulties. So uh, I think if anybody wants to buy a fairly new iMac, um, <laughs> it'll be for sale tomorrow. <laughs> 
Um, well, we were saying it was our 13th episode, so we're going to have a little glitchy glitch here You said to me, are you there. superstitious? And I said no. Yeah. Oh, I am. <laughs> and now the, com- now the computer's like, so, yeah? Okay, just, just. Uh, all right. Okay. We'll see about that. All right. All right. So um, I want to just do a couple of things with our slideshow so that I can maybe get what's problematic out yeah that sounds is good is that okay yeah that's fine um do you want to talk is there stuff you want to start talking about as we're sort of moving towards that well i know you wanted to talk about buying art for the holidays and that <gasps> right thank one you. before we move on to something else right. i don't want to forget about that so i actually had the pleasure of noticing that one of my friends who's an artist in chicago dropped a beautiful work on paper this morning on Facebook, and she has an amazing collection of work that Mm -hmm. she's uh, got for sale. And so I managed to score this beautiful piece uh, from her. Her name is Jamie Foster, spelled J-A-I-M-E Foster. Now I was going to put a slide up with that information, but I'm deathly afraid of touching that button. Should I do it? You could try. If it blacks out, just Hang in there, okay? <laughs> well, what I'm gonna do, hmm, what do I do here? Hmm. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna try and take a few slides out of this. I think I'm gonna pull the slide out that I think is problematic. So bear with me while I do this. I don't even know if you guys can see this. Hopefully it won't cause any major disruptions. Well, that's the piece if you can see it. No, they can't see that they right now. I don't that. think so. Ooh. I don't think they can see that. I don't know. They might be able to see that. They might be able to see that. This is Jamie Foster. This is one of Jamie Foster's pieces, which we're really in love with. And uh, these are gorgeous little paper pieces that incorporate a mixed variety of media. Uh, and uh, oh, there's Ben. Hi, Ben. Good to see you. Mike says can see. Anyway, I picked up a small paperwork of hers today, and I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to mention you on the show. And so uh, I just wanted to put a shout out to her. I did have um, some information on her, uh, but you can find her at jamiefoster.com, J-A-I-M-E, Foster, F-O-S-T-E-R.com. So take a look at her stuff. Now, here's where things get wacky. I'm gonna see if I can move us forward here without having this thing freak out on me. It can, good, okay, good. So. Okay. Good. Let's leave that image up for now. I think I know what was causing the problem. Okay, good. Okay. I will say that's the fantastic thing about you. You fix things immediately. Like, you're so good at that. I've been fixing this computer all day long. I feel like that's all I've done. And uh, while I am an enormous proponent of Macs, and I know that you're a PC, I think I'm coming over to your side soon. Yay. I, 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 I just, <laughs> I don't know. This Maybe. has been driving me crazy. Yeah, this has been... These right. are not these are not made to be streaming machines. Anyway, yeah. let's talk about little Jerry Saltz. A quick reading. A quick reading. A quick reading. Okay, let's do a quick. Oh, by the way, Mike Raider's here. Oh yeah, there's a fantastic show out right now. Mike Raider's got a show. Mike, I want you to put in the chat. I believe it's Brownstone Projects or Brownstone Gallery. I think it's Brownstone Gallery. Brownstone Gallery. It, he's got a great show up uh, right now that uh, has a really nice web interface to go and look at the work. Uh, you really got to go check that out. I'm going to post. Where can I post that? I can post that. We have a Facebook page. This is all stuff for it. See, if Andrew was in it, he could be hooking us up right now. I'm going to do it right now. I'm okay. going to get it. Hold on. Um, I think it's called Brownstone. I should have had this ready to go, and I didn't. And I'm pretty sure it's here. Is this it? I don't think that's it. That is not it. Hold on a minute. Mike's gonna put it in. Come on, Mike. Tell me what. Tell me. Tell me what I'm supposed to be doing here. I'm looking for it. Brownstone Gallery. Um, here it comes. He's like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I'm looking for this guy. Ga- I'm looking for a link for you. I know you can go on his Instagram or yes. something, or no, the I gallery's know, I, Instagram. I'm pulling you up. Please hold. That's probably not going to be on the front page of your website. Um, Hmm. Mike, there's a ton of stuff on Google about you. Here it is. Brownstone art. Brownstone art. Thank you. The brownstone art. Okay, hold on. Pulling it up. The 
brownstoneart.com. I'm going to put this because you guys unfortunately cannot post links in the chat. Um, you can go to, I think, current exhibition. Yep. Please hold, people. Please hold. There it is. There it is. I really want to get this in there so you guys can see this at some point. I mean, don't leave the show, but after the show is over, you can take a look up there. So there it is, the brownstoneart.com forward slash current exhibition, Mike Rader's prosthesis show. Really awesome show. So go check that out. Um, okay. So, and tell your friends, too. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so, so definitely on the shout out, Mike, always. Let's do some Jerry. Let's do some Jerry. Okay. So. Every week we read to you from this book, although eventually we'll run out, and you can tell that I open this and close it a lot. The binding is broken, the pages are falling apart. It is a really nice book, but I have uh, worn it out, which all good books should be worn out. Uh, tonight we're gonna read chapter six, Embrace Genre. Genre is a major factor in the way we think about art. The portrait is a genre. So are the still life, the landscape, animal painting, history painting, comedy and tragedy are genres. So are sonnets, science fiction, yay science fiction, pop, gospel, and hip-hop. Genres possess their own formal logic, tropes, and principles. They create useful commonalities of response and place your work in the flow of history. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley invented the modern Gothic in a fever dream of writing that became Frankenstein. Horror writers have been revisiting the story of the doctor and his lonely monster ever since. What's the difference between genre and style? Style is the unstable essence an artist brings to a genre. What ensures that no two crucifixions say look the same? Oscar Wilde said that style is what makes us believe in a thing. Madame Bovary is a simple mor morality tale. Flaubert's style makes it a masterpiece. Dolly Parton's Jolene is a Jolene, Jolene as if. Dolly Parton's Jolene is a classic country song, country story song. The vulnerability of her performance is what makes you die inside when you hear it. A fresh style breathes life into any genre. So I think what they're saying here is that when we approach a genre that maybe we feel is tired or dead, mm -hmm. or I, I think I think we kind of need to sort of give ourselves permission to maybe continue that exploration. Yeah. And I think tonight's example is a good uh, way of looking or a good thing to look at in that light. I think. I think so. I think I think so. Yeah. Um, so should we start? We should start. Okay. Um, but in the true manner of exploration, let's slowly go into it with a <laughs> with a little tour. You want a little tour of Harvard? Let's do a little tour of Harvard. Harvard. Mike, if I'm not mistaken, you taught there. Could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think you taught there. Uh, Okay, so let's look at a, a little collection okay. at Harvard. Well, to begin with, um, when we were talking about doing a show, this was, you saw this one collection, and you're like, we have to do this show. And I was looking at it, I'm like, how could we dive right into such a delicate and fragile genre? <laughs> so um, we started looking at the place that Yale. Oh, Yale, yeah. sorry. Oh. So we Didn't start, mean to confuse those two. Yep. So we started looking at the place that these these. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> she doesn't want to say it yet. She doesn't want to say it. Ugh. It's so, in the title of the I know. stream. So well, we wanted to look at the place where these flowers grew, right? Mm. So when you look at Harvard, there's a lot of museums there. There's a lot of collections all over the place. Um, there's a whole museum conglomerate that's made up of the Fogg Museum and the Arthur Sackler Gallery. And there's an Arthur Sackler Gallery down in D.C. that I used to visit all the time when I lived down there. Mm -hmm. The MIT Museum is right next door in Cambridge also, which is a fantastic yeah, museum. Yeah, there's tons and tons of museums there. And you can get lost in them. They've got all kinds of art from all over the world, from all different genres, from all different artists. So you could start there, but then you can go a little bit deeper. So one really interesting collection, since what we're going to be looking at is a collection, this kind of was in the same ballpark. It really was in the same district. So I thought this would be an interesting thing to talk about too, just as an aside, because we're in the town of our Cambridge. Cambridge. So we're going to talk about... 
Oh, shit. Us. <laughs> We're going to talk about <laughs> nothing because we crashed again. So. <laughs> <laughs> and also here. Okay, good. Good, good, good. I swear this was our first stream ever and yeah. also here. Our here and also here. 13th episode. I just like to reiterate that. <sighs> Oh, memory, memory vessels vessel. here. Hey, good okay. to see you. All we right. keep crashing. We keep crashing. So anyway, go ahead. Anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. So we were talking about being in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're going to lead slowly into this. <laughs> this thing. So anyway, um, <laughs> my segue was so good. All right. I'm just going to drop it. It's the Harvard Pigment Library. So what we see here up on the screen is the inside the museum. Um, there are over 2,500 pigments collected from all over the world. Um, they were collected by uh, Edward Forbes, who is the Strauss Center founder, and he was also the former Fog Art Museum director. Um, and this was actually done, he started doing this because he had actually purchased a painting that needed restoration. So he was searching for restorative pigments. And this kind of took him all over the world to some very rare pigments yeah. that are priceless. Right. Um, so uh, this is at the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies. Um, and when you go in there, not only can you witness all these gorgeous medicinal bottles filled with a variety of different pi pigments, but you can also see um, conservationists at work utilizing them. They utilize the pigments. That's yes. what blows my mind is that some of these things are super rare yeah. and priceless, yet they're dipping into them for perfectly accurate restoration projects, yes, which exactly. is just fantastic. It's, it's mind blowing. And um, some of them, like this, I think they, you know, they have the whole shade of blue, but they have lapis lazuli mm -hmm. from Afghanistan. Um, they have one yellow color uh, that has an interesting story. Um, and it's Indian yellow. It's from the urine of cows that were fed mango leaves. This was extremely rare. They stopped doing it because, you know, it wasn't good for the cows to be eating mango leaves and they were getting Oh, they were feeding the mango leaves specifically for the pigment? Yeah, uh. so they, they stopped that practice. But um, so a lot of the pigments in this collection are rare. They A lot of them have fantastic stories too. Um, there's another one called Tyrian Purple. That's from the secretion of a dangerous sea snail. Uh, and I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly. It's Bolinus brindaris. Um, at very high cost during the Byzantine uh, era, the emperors forbade its use. And they said, because it was priceless, they just couldn't find it. And they, um, that's why it's called royal purple, uh -huh. because only you could use it in the royal court. Right. So the, huh. all these pigments have these fantastic stories, and it's right around the corner from, from a still called Indian yellow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it is. And Amanda says, I love the book, The Secret Lives of Color about the history of pigments. I love that too. That yeah. book, I have that on the shelf. It's a great book. Yeah, but if you wanted to go see someplace where it's housed and they're using them for restorative purposes, this is the place to go to. By the way, if any of you want to see these slides again, you're not going to be able to because instead of advancing the slides, I'm deleting them, which is then showing the next consecutive slide. Hopefully that'll work. Um, <laughs> We'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, I so I have, and I was gonna bring them upstairs to show on camera tonight, but then I realized, you know, first of all, pigments themselves, dried pigments, pigments themselves, are extremely dangerous mm -hmm. because they're ground from various minerals, metals, uh, things that went ingested either through your airways or you know through your skin, mm -hmm. are highly toxic. Yeah. Well, they were also saying they've harvested some of these pigments from deadly animals and plants, too. So yeah, there are organic pigments for right, sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I have, uh, I managed, I was fortunate enough to inherit my great, great grandmother's collection of pigments. And it actually, some of the jars I found, Harvard has some of the same exact vials that she has. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be fascinating. Now, we haven't come across them yet, although I do have that little, that, that turquoise blue one in the middle, I have a few bottles like that. But hers are very, very slender. And she used to mix uh, china paints 
out of them. Mm -hmm. Now this collection that I have is stored in a box and even though the corks are on tight and the, you know, the box is well preserved, those pigments get out and yeah. you can sense the dust when you open that box. And so I was going to bring them up to show them off and I realized, no, I should probably wear a respirator at minimum <laughs> when, when handling those. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. but I, I find this, this collection to be just fantastic and I would love to I have not seen this one in person but mm -mm. as soon as now they have made some interesting acquisitions over the past few years like recently they uh, acquired John Singer Sargent's brushes and then they also uh, got a hold of Georgia O'Keeffe's pigments too oh. so those are also featured there right now Mike wants to know if there's a tasting menu there would and I'm, I'm assuming that means to to actually to try them out you know from a painting sense correct or are you am i totally missing the mark you're looking at me like no you dummy there's no, a hidden I, joke in there and you're not getting no, it I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be able to go up there and actually look through them you yeah. know like, because i think you know when you have certain credentials and you can get into collections like these to actually do research mm -hmm. I, I would love to be able to you know mix up a little bit of paint yeah that'd be pretty phenomenal i'd like to use your grandmother's you use your grandmother's and do that with as well yeah the um and for those of you who don't know how this works i mean basically paint is pigment suspended in a vehicle of some sort whether that's an acrylic medium an oil medium some other delivery method that, like watercolor uh that actually suspends the pigment and allows it to be distributed in a particular way. So with acrylic paint, the acrylic medium itself polymerizes, it turns into it turns into a plastic while the pigment is suspended in it. With oil paints, uh, the, a skin develops over the top and actually that paint stays wet underneath that skin for a very, very long time. Um, so uh, I, I love the science behind mixing mm -hmm. and 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 actually i used to have this fantastic book it was called formulas for painters and it had these recipes in it for utilizing things like melting down damar crystals mixing them with different types of waxes different types of oh my god it was fantastic wow. I, I think it was probably one of the most deadliest books i had in the house though mm -hmm. if, if you ever you know should do that stuff right, right. beautiful right. stuff though yep. Well, the collection itself is beautiful too. I'm loving these little bottles and how they're categorized. And yeah, you know, from a medical perspective, I love that they're used because they they look like you know medicinal and they're used to doctor paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, they're used to heal paintings. Right. So I just I oh, love. Oh yeah, they do have their own kind they of do. medicinal purpose. They have a purpose. curative purpose. Mm -hmm. So I I just really love that collection. I can't wait to go up there and see it once all of this is over and the, we can go out there. These are actually the exact vials that I have of my great great grandmother's pigments. So oh, wow. They're long and slender like this and they have identical labels to those on there. They were the types of labels where you wrote on there mm -hmm. what you had in the bottle. Okay. And so her handwriting is still on a lot of those, uh, oh, is wow. on all of them actually. Mm -hmm. It's really quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to have Ann Bennett's books on mixing her pigments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Ann Bennett was my great, great grandmother and uh, we have a bunch of her work. She was alive during the era of the Pre-Raphaelites um, and painted in that style actually, which is you know kind of fun. Mm -hmm. All right, so tonight's show is not necessarily on the Harvard no, pigments. No, this is just in the same this neighborhood, was, so we wanted to talk about it a little bit. You know, and we also kind of wanted to show you that um, how something mundane can be elevated to have a level of importance or almost become extraordinary just by the fact that it is placed within that museum mm -hmm. culture, that museum aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's carefully handled, it's it cataloged, is, yeah. it is it is it's treated with displayed. a level. Yeah, yeah. You you know you can, um, Mike Rader. Can we see your grandmother's paintings? Ah, you, why yes. Why yes. Right now, or? Hmm. Mm, they're big. Well, the one I'm thinking is large and fragile, so I don't know if you want. Technically, to... we are in a bar right now, and so I don't, <laughs> I don't have them right here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I could, I could go, I could go grab one if you. Do you want to start and introducing that, and this? I'm also superstitious. Yeah, we can. Um, well, it's fragile, just like our next uh, topic. I'm trying to think of uh, the one I want to grab. Where do I have that stored? 
Is that the painting on porcelain? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, is that the one? It was in the bedroom. I don't know, no, not that one. That I'm not bringing that down here. Okay. That's big. There's one. Yeah. All right. Let me here. go. I'll be back. All right. Take over, Tara. I'm going to take over, but I don't want to uh, give too much away. So, um, so he's getting that. That's a pretty fragile piece. His grandmother did this long, long time ago. Um, they're stunning. And I'm going to let him talk about it. I don't want to go into the next thing yet, because if I go into the next thing, it's kind of like skipping over this topic. So don't do anything to risk them. I agree. And it's our 13th episode, so I feel like oh, that's God, just putting it at risk right episode. now because it's number 13. But this is beautiful, and we have to hide our faces because it loves focusing on faces. All right, so, so that's one of them. It's on porcelain, right? Yeah, it's on, a, it's on a porcelain plate. This is without a date, but I'm going to put this somewhere. What would you say, Mom? Mom's going to be the best one to give me the date on this. So she'll pop that in there. But anyway, it's also quite heavy, so I'm going to um, mm -hmm. take it back. But that's one of them. And we have we have a number of them. Maybe just lay it down for now. Oh, I'm not going to rehang it right okay. now. Okay. This is Tilly. I hope I spelled it right. Late 1800s. That's what, that's what I had it pegged at. Okay. All right, you guys got He's a treat. coming back. Okay. You guys got a treat. Yes. All right. So anyway, anyway. Um, that's made with those pigments. Those pigments, and yeah. And so that's kind of an exciting connection. I'm Mike, or who was it that asked? Was that Mike? Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Um, this is Tilly. I hope I spelled it right. You did. You did. All right. So let's talk about tonight. Okay. Um, you want to start? I can start. I was waiting for you. So the, actually... Todd, you've actually seen this collection live oh, and in love person, this collection. and he's the one who said we have to do this collection. So this is the Glass Flowers by the Blaschka family. It's actually a father-son duo, yep. Leopold and Rudolph. Mm -hmm. um, I love how the story evolves. Um, they're from Germany, right? Or Czechla Czechoslovakia? I believe it's their Czech. Dresden, Germany. Oh, they are German. Okay, they are sorry. German. I'm like going back and you, forth you for can, a second. You confuse me for I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, no, they're from Germany, uh, but Czech. But they were. But they. I guess they, they were lived, living they in, lived Dresden, in Germany, Germany. But they were from. They're originally that's of Czech why I'm descent. That's confused. Yes, that's okay. what it is. Yeah. But for over fifty years, they worked on um, these beautiful glass flowers. And when I say glass flowers, they look exactly like flowers. So. The first time when I went to see that, I was told you must go see this collection at Harvard. You have to go up there and see it. And I was like, glass flowers? It sounded awful. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted, it's completely, just hearing that made me completely disinterested. And I thought shiny, I thought Dale Chihuly, I thought just not, not that there's anything, well, anyway. Um, so I didn't think that this is what they would look like. And when you see them, your head comes off. You have never seen anything like this. And even to this day, and you're going to hear somebody in one of the videos we're going to show you say these exact words, there is no one alive working in glass today that has their skill set. Mm -hmm. No one. This, this is gone. But these look like physical botanical specimens mm -hmm. that are captured and frozen in time, but they are made of glass. Mm -hmm. And it is just mind-boggling do you use different fluid vehicles for different surfaces i assume when you mean mixing paint audrey and um to a degree yes but not all the time so can you paint on any surface with any paint no mm. um so are there paints specific to some surfaces yeah but um like if i'm painting on canvas you know there's a number of different paints that would work mm. in that uh, obviously we could paint in acrylic we could paint in oil we could right. paint in yeah, you, you wouldn't know. paint in watercolor, though. You, you know? wouldn't paint in watercolor like, on a canvas. That's an example of something you probably wouldn't do. Right, Okay. right. So, yeah, the answer is yes, but it, that's contextual. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyway, these flowers are absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. And I saw them before the restoration. Wow. 
the restoration of the museum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's changed. Okay. So would you believe that there's 4,300 models? It's kind of, when you see the level of detail and work that's gone into these, it's hard to believe that there are, that that many could possibly exist in a person's lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, I was reading about their technique. So it's some glass blowing, but it's a lot of melting the glass. Um, they do use wire armatures um, to give it some form. Uh, some, some pieces are blown, some are colored glass, some are um, hand colored with a wash. Um, and then they fuse it to the, the armature. Right. It's called lamp working for the most part. Um, it's done over a torch and it is uh, a very, very slow, careful process. And given that, the amount of work that exists in these is just stupefying. Mm -hmm. It's stupefying. I, I just can't figure out, that, like I walk around in in awe of, of the examples, obviously, but then of course my, there's, there's, there's so many different interest levels for me in this place. Number one, that whole museum culture, that elevation of the object in the case to this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. level of uh, this, you know, you could put a bottle cap in a museum case and it becomes important. Right. Right. And so to me that, that tickles a certain collector bone mm -hmm. in me. And then there's the, then there's the craftsmanship element of it, which just makes me like crazy. And so mm -hmm. I see these things and I just can't stop looking at mm -hmm. them. Um, well, what I like about these is how they came to fruition because they were actually not created as a, f I mean, they are a form of art, but they were actually created because they were botanical models. Mm -hmm. Um, they were, um, back then, this uh, Professor George Lincoln Goodale, he was a Harvard Botanical uh, Museum finder, founder. Um, <laughs> but what he was doing was he wanted some realistic models. And back during this time, they were either made of paper mache or wax. They didn't look realistic. Um, the other thing that they were doing to preserve flowers at that time was to get that uh, special paper um, and to press them. But mm -hmm. of course, they became distorted. They became discolored. They didn't hold up at all. So um, Professor Goodale found the Blaschkas, um, and he had seen their work doing the marine aquatic series. Right. And at the time, they had been doing these glass models for marine studies, and they were making them very lifelike, octopuses, jellyfish. And he went to Dresden, Germany to pursue, um, to pursue and try to entice them to come to Harvard and uh, create these flowers. And they did. Like, they came and they started making flowers for him, but then um, the Blaschkas were still doing the marine life at the same time, so they divide up their year. Six months working on marine life, mm -hmm. six months working on flowers, and it started, be you know, Harvard, uh, Professor Goodale was getting greedy, and the Blaschkas wanted to focus on just one thing, so they came to him in Harvard offered them a contract for 10 years that they would solely work on just the plants and that's how the collection blossomed blossomed oh, yes i saw what you did there you like that that was good <laughs> um we have a couple of videos to show you around this work which is absolutely the, the all three of these videos are fascinating they're they're put out by harvard um about the collection but they really do a nice job of showing you number one the detail that's present in these is not coming through in these photos no not at it all it definitely will come through in the video uh they do talk about the restoration um projects that they've gone through even the cases that these are stored in have been completely restored back to their original glory they're mm -hmm. beautiful um so i kind of want to show you those i'm hoping with this thing doesn't crash uh, i'm going to stop using if it my does, just hang tight no i'm gonna i think it, we're gonna try not to let it crash this time but let's see if we can get um this going Hold on a second. I'm so afraid to push my stream deck because I think it's my stream deck that's actually doing this. And that doesn't seem to want to turn it on. Okay, hold on a second. Life in the, where is it? Where are you? How's that? No. Hmm. 
it's coming. Don't worry. I kind of want to have that please stand by music going where it's like. I think there's background music. <laughs> not on this screen. There isn't actually. No. I mute the background music because um, it is distracting when we're trying to show a video. So I got mm -hmm. rid of that. There we go. I'm going to have to do a little resizing because I had to every week this happens. This is getting to be old. You'd think I'd have this down by now, but Ooh, no. Oh, look at our green screen. That got us. <laughs> you gave it away. We don't, uh, we have no, mean, there's no green screen. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Sorry. All right, so um, let's watch this. I think you're going to like this. This is, um, this is a little introduction to the whole collection. Um, actually, you know what I want to do first? Let's look at this one first. Ooh. The Rotten Apples. And this was a fairly recent exhibit within the past yes. couple years. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, but this really shows the detail off really nicely. So take a look at this. When we look at an apple like this, we don't necessarily think of beauty. We think of uh, what's happening to the apple. But I'm a mycologist by training. And so what I look at this, when I look at this, I think, gee, look at all that spore production there. Look at all that's going on with that apple. Rotten apples seems like an odd thing to come out and look at, but these are a set of models that were part of a series that the Blaschkas did. They illustrate the diseases of plants. They are blown glass, and they're painted, and they're colored. They're fantastic representations of what the real things look like. For me, it's looking at these and realizing that if I zoom in, I bring out my microscope and I look at these, there's fantastic structures to be seen. And we have one model that is particularly instructive in that way. It's called Aspergillus. It's a glass model of a fungus, and if you kind of let yourself think about this, it's almost like walking through a forest. It's so beautiful, the way in which it's arranged, and it shows these developmental stages of how the spores are formed. These models are part of a kind of experimental series with Rudolf Blaschka, where he was using different techniques and different classes. In some cases, the, the glass had a kind of effervescence on the surface of the apple. And so each of these was cleaned to remove that powdery coating, and then they were painted and touched up uh, so that they are really kind of the apple of our eye. We can look at them and appreciate them as objects that are both the model and they remind us of apple pie and candy apples and all those wonderful things. We think of the museum as being a primary way in which Harvard research and activities can be presented to the public. And in an exhibit like this, which we think is topical and important for people to realize about food security and food sources, it's another way to reach out and reach the public. And because of its beauty, because of the rarity of these models, and because of the stories that we can tell around the apples and their diseases, we think that the public will leave with a broader appreciation of both museums and of biology of plants. So I love that. I do too. I love the, the I, I love what Mike just said a few minutes ago. He goes, those are beautiful. It makes me feel like I don't own any fingers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's like, it is a level of accomplishment. It is mm -hmm. a level, I, first of all, I, I love thinking about the way material transforms mm -hmm. and how things defy their nature mm -hmm. and this defies glass on every level it does you don't think of glass when you look at it um, I I can really appreciate it from a medical viewpoint and just that um, how professor Goodale saw the glass 
being so having that quality to represent something so organic because we're not thinking like you said earlier we're not thinking of it in terms like that well and once you get past the wonder Mm -hmm. right because there's certainly a wonderment factor here which is i think what we really dive into first but once you get past that Mm -hmm. you're allowed to be with that specimen and and it is it is uh it's doing its job. It's doing its educational job, what it was intended to do. Right. And it does it very, very well. It does. I don't, I don't think the Blaschkas set out to say, we're going to blow your minds yeah. with this magic trick. In my research, when I was like looking up some stuff on this too, and I can't remember the exact site, but I believe there's some YouTube video out there where they were... We just crashed again. No, we didn't. Oh. <laughs> well, there was some YouTube site where they... Um, they had a scientist compare the glass flowers to the real deal because they wanted mm. to know how authentic they were. So right. he was actually putting some of the the finer parts of the, the glass flowers underneath the, the uh, microscope, and he was actually counting the elements of them. And he found them to be so exact and so precise. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, and, and I think what happens in something like this is the comfort zone a craftsperson has with their material Mm -hmm. allows them to uh, allows them to sort of perform a certain set of tasks comfortably right Mm -hmm. so if i've never worked with marble before i'm not going to try and go out and create my most detailed specimen or my most you know wanting specimen out of a material i've never touched right but in this case if if they're comfortable enough to go to that microscopic level yeah with the material Mm -hmm. that says something about how much time they spend with it right and and also about how much they've you know like sculpture and, and and this type of work revolves a lot around the limitations of a material understanding the various um properties of that material Mm -hmm. and so in order to become it's like a second language and Mm -hmm. you have to spend a lot of time with it to really understand those things deeply Mm -hmm. i feel like they really know that they really do and then they also really understand the um the details of botany i mean to capture it on that level too i mean not like i understand that they are they understand the materials too but they are that committed and dedicated to finding out the most minute detail and getting it right yeah absolutely and well and and that you know to it shows they have an understanding of botany because they know where to look Mm -hmm. they know why certain connections happen and how to represent those connections right and i do believe that the professor made sure that they had access to all kinds of gardens um around them um, they themselves had a garden that they grew certain species of flowers in. Um, so they had access to all these different uh, educational places and gardens so that they could explore and, and create these flowers. I want to show another video. Mm-hmm. Can we? Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at another one. Hopefully we won't crash in the transition here. Um, Pumpkin Audrey's like, I do too. I see your work in here, Todd. Yeah. You know what, Mike? Thanks. You're... I'm going to get you an extra special gift for that. I appreciate that because this is like, <laughs> this is one of my major influences. I, I When I saw this, I, I just, my whole world changed when I saw this for the first time. Let's take a look at another. This has the whole, the, uh, the whole restoration project in it. You're going to love this. As a graduate student, it was about 1968. Oop, I didn't get it back all the way. Here we go. Sorry about that. I came here as a graduate student. It was about 1968 and uh, everybody said you have to see the glass flowers and I have to admit that I thought what what do they mean the glass flowers and of course my reaction is what everybody's reaction is uh, they can't be glass we think of glass as shiny smooth and if one looks at the models the leaves are wonderfully realistic the colors are vivid and accurate the maple for example it's like being out in the forest in the fall around here the sugar maple is colored up my name is leslie fleming i'm a glass sculptor working with many of the same techniques as the blaschkas use so i use rods of colored glass which are about the thickness of a pencil and I melt these over a torch that burns oxygen and propane 
and this makes a flame of about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the tools I use to manipulate the glass are simple and not much different than what the Blaschkas use. Basically a cheese knife, tweezers, a poker, and masher is similar to what you'd use at a barbecue grill. Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka's glasswork is absolutely phenomenal. There's no one alive today that can touch their skill level. They lived in a time where people had to make their own things or repair their own things. And one of their primary advantages was this lineage of artistic and craftsmanship knowledge that each of them grew up with. One of our guiding principles with the renovation is that we always wanted to keep the character and the integrity and the aesthetics of the exhibit. We're making some really necessary updates to make the space better for our visitors and for the collection itself. It's gonna be more open. It's gonna have a better flow for our visitors. And people are gonna see a lot of old favorite models and some new models that haven't been on exhibit for quite some time. When the cases are first brought into the shop, the first thing we have to do is disassemble them. Some look bright red, some look brown, some look very pale yellow. We made them all uniform after we stained it with a water-based aniline dye, which is actually the same process they would have used 100 years ago. We then sealed it with a clear shellac sealer and toned them, put a uh, pigment glaze, and then we finished them with a uh, satin sheen uh, lacquer. We had to remove all the old glass, which is here, which was 5 16 inch thick plate glass. Christopher had to measure it all. We had to make a list. We had to send for the uh, non-leaded safety glass, something that would not shatter. And it also will uh, show the colors in the flowers true as they could be. So we put a bed of glaze down. We set the glass in. We replaced uh, these wooden doors with these doors, which are handmade. When they were being deconstructed, I might have mentioned that we found the signatures of four of the original case makers. We are going to mill down and uh, reinstall. So when the doors are opened, you'll be able to see uh, the signatures and uh, they will continue to live on. <laughs> You've done all this work for nine months and then uh, it still looks terrible until you clean all the little fine residue off. The legs went in separately, the tops then go in, and then we uh, reconnect them on site. We carried them out the first couple of times, but uh, that was enough of that. Uh, <laughs> This lab is brand new. It's only been in operation since October 2015. The room is also serving as storage for most of the collection of glass flowers. The surfaces of most of, or if not all of these models, is affected by um, the slow deposition of dirt and dust over time. But also, there's soils and oily dirt from soot from the days when coal was used heating the building. So I use a solvent that um, actually affects the, um, the soot and the dirt and picks it up, but leaves anything that's water soluble alone. And one of the problems with the uh, earlier glass models is that they were coated with an organic coating that allowed the models to be painted. When that coating uh, dried up and shrank away from the glass, we would get edge peeling. And each of these details in this uh, transverse section of the ovary are glued down with animal glue. Um, this one looks it's even disrupted. Yep, this one has already broken up and it's, uh, it needs to be consolidated. So this is a very serious problem that um, we're trying to solve here in conservation. I think when people went into the old gallery, because of the way that exhibit was mounted, it was large, it was complicated, it was hard to interpret. So I think people went away with some understanding, perhaps, of certain plants and their anatomy, but not any kind of unified view. And I think what we're hoping for now, uh, that people will come in, they'll have a sense that there is a classification for those plants that we're following. We're hoping that they'll uh, walk away with a little bit of knowledge about how a flower is built, for example. So it really expands the way that we can present these, both as objects of art, but also ways of understanding the organisms.
It's a fantastic video. Um, I, I, you know, I heard so many things that I wanted to kind of make comments on in there. I'm sure you did too. Um, but one thing I noticed was the cabinet maker. He stopped to say that the glass was five sixteenths inch plate. Yes. And so from somebody who's worked with this stuff before, I thought, oh my God, those cases must have weighed 500 pounds a piece. Uh -huh. That's incredibly thick. Yeah. I mean, it's a little over a quarter of an inch, but over that much surface area, that's a lot of glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It's pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. But I mean, and that's just, you know, it's just storage, right? But I think it's part of the collection too. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Mm -hmm. I liked how that video also showed some of the root systems of the plants too. Oh. Like they really were that oh. committed to the detail that they, oh. and that was gorgeous. So, well, I have a little video on the actual, uh, the, uh, the marine life examples as well. And there's uh, one in there of this jellyfish like creature, this yes. invertebrate that is just spectacular. Let's throw that up really, really quickly okay. so that we can, um, so that we can watch that. Cause I think everybody's going to like that. This is a really short, this is, this is short. This isn't yeah. bad. And this is how the whole thing started um, with Professor Goodale seeing these. There was a period after then, Darwin when there was tremendous right. interest the in the natural world and those who could afford it were clamoring to get examples of, of life and uh, to put on display in many cases in their homes. It's historically important in revealing to us how people learned about the natural world. Most people know the Blaschkas as the people who, f who manufactured the glass flowers. Before they started making glass flowers for Harvard, they made a variety of other things. Oh, they used awesome. to make glass <laughs> eyes, uh, but also they started <laughs> manufacturing glass invertebrates, and they used to sell them through mail order catalogs. I want that catalog. The models were acquired by the uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology in the 19th century at the behest of uh, either the first director, Louis Agassiz, who founded the Museum of Comparative Zoology in 1859, or his son, Alexander, who succeeded him as director in 1873. Both Louis and Alexander were tremendous marine zoologists, and it's very understandable that they would have wanted to accumulate a tremendous number of these things. They served the same purpose as did the glass flowers yes. when undergraduates yes, really were do. taught here as a means of showing them living animals and plants. The faculty in those days typically would show them models. When we first started assessing the models that the MCZ owned, I was told there were about 60 or 70 models. So we started going to each one of the departments and uncovering what they had there. Some departments had them on display but other departments had them very carefully wrapped up and tucked away so they couldn't get uh, harmed anyway. When we started uncovering them, we kept on finding more and more. It took us about six months to completely go through the different invertebrate departments to find them, and it ended up being a total of 430 models. We realized that we needed to do a more in-depth assessment to see what kind of detailed conservation work need to be done. And a woman named Elizabeth Brill came to us highly recommended. She actually had familiarity with, the with these invertebrates themselves, which is very useful when you're talking about finding a tentacle and trying to figure out exactly which animal it belongs to. That. In working with about 1,100 of these objects now, I find that there are little bits and pieces that have been tucked away in envelopes and bottle caps and little plastic boxes. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. The tricky part about working with these models is that they're all made differently. They were made over the course of 25 years, and the two men who made them were working in different ways from one another, and they were using different materials. The marine critters have mostly colorless glass with paint on top, mm -hmm. and that presents all sorts of other conservation questions and treatments and um, ways of approaching the object at all. And the, uh. the flowers are, are different from that and have a lot of color in the glass themselves. It's really about evaluating each model as I come to it and treating it as a new object. It's provided a wonderful opportunity to do chemical analyses and other research about the materials that the Blaschkas used. One of the most exciting analyses was we took x-rays of, of a handful of the objects. In the x-rays, you can see the, the wires 
inside the glass that the, that the glass is formed around in certain instances. It's a magnificent example of being able to Look see the, the, wire, the glass yeah. that has, has lead, lead, lead in it swallow. in the composition mm -hmm. of the glass versus the glass that doesn't have lead in it, the soda lime glass. It's so in one swallow. object, mm -hmm. they used two different kinds of glass in three different ways. A lot of people know what an apple tree blossom looks like. So you go in the flower display here and you see an apple tree blossom and you're blown away at how similar this is. You can be six inches from this thing and, and not believe that it's made of glass. These things are made for educational purposes. And being able to say to people that parallel with the apple tree blossom works for this sea cucumber. If you see this in the ocean, it looks just like this. And it's a, an amazing teaching tool. Just amazing. These things are still doing what they were made to do. All right. So um, those are the three videos we have for you. I really feel like this has this something so special. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually mad now that we can't drive up there next week and go see I them. I know. <laughs> I know. It's definitely on like, the to-do list once all of this you, is You cannot. I, I have to tell you, if you get a chance, if there's a museum that you're willing to travel a, a decent amount to go to, get up to Cambridge and go to the Harvard Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. It is unlike anything. And that, this collection is just, it'll yeah. change your life. Yep. And there's a lot to see up there, um, especially with the flowers and the pigment library and all of all of those things. So lots and, and lots. There's a really cool artist we're going to bring to you at some point from a museum right next door to that called the MIT Museum. And that artist is uh, actually really quite interesting in a completely different, but also sort of in, in a sense of his craft and detail. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating huh. in a very different way. Okay. So we'll bring that to you guys at another point. And it is 10 after 9. Ooh. Okay. So let's just remind everybody, if you haven't followed us yet and you're sitting here watching, consider giving us a follow. We come every Tuesday night with something really awesome in the arts to watch, some kind of theme or potentially an artist. So give us a follow. Um, and for the rest of those of you, um, thanks for watching. Yeah, thank thanks you for so hanging much. out. I really enjoyed tonight. I, I feel so good. Yeah. showing this work yeah this is really stellar work well i mean it's it's different from what we typically show it is and, and, but I, but i really feel like this is another end of that spectrum that i really i mean I, there's so many avenues we can take with this mm -hmm. we often talk about like the notion of like the lowbrow pop surrealism mm -hmm. stuff we mm -hmm. talk about this level of this other kind of craft right well these are like delicate preserved beautiful flowers and in a cold time like winter and with everything going on right now it's just it's a it's a stunning collection to take a look at yeah and and um i, I i'm absolutely in love with what amanda just said definitely want to go see large glass road trip bus Ooh. huh that would be fun that would be fun well i will say this one thing we are going to do this summer so teeny's bar is under construction and it is being built it's going to mm -hmm. function as a speakeasy for those of you who do not know and to some of our more loyal supporters which i know most of you watching right now are um you're going to receive special invitations we're going to be doing art exhibitions in teenies on a monthly basis in the warmer months so hopefully mm -hmm. given a vaccine and given a you know a calming of this yeah. we're going to be outside showing art in a speakeasy mm -hmm. in, a, in a setting that you know is going to be for large glass people so um get ready for that that's going to be exciting but we might be able to let that bus trip pull right out of yeah, the teeny's parking awesome. lot and head to boston for a weekend yeah um it says, ha-ha, we can eat at the Providence restaurant at the end of the field trip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, you're totally going to be our events coordinator, Amanda. I can see it coming. <laughs> Carol's like, brilliant. Yeah. I think we'd all be, we could probably all fit in a, I don't know, one of those vans that holds like. I know. We have to think about it because I got ideas. So. Oh, yeah. Terry's, Terry's we'll, gears we'll are turned. Amanda's on it. Oh, here's Am. Hey. Hi, Am. <laughs> I'm only going if we eat at Subway. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, we'll think about it. Yeah. Um, you know, when I taught in Paris, my students always wanted to eat at Subway. I forbade them. Huh. It's like you're in Paris. You're not eating at Subway. Why do they want to eat at Subway, though? And none of them were Americans either. Hmm. They all just wanted to eat American food. <laughs> okay. Well, um, okay. Carolyn's like, you go, Terry. 
I went after every class. No, LOL. No joke. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Well, we'll think about it, ma'am. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll stop for you. Um, <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, we had a great night, and I, yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming. And, yeah. um, and for sticking through all the little glitches with us. Yeah, sorry about the freaking crashes. I'm not surprised. I'm superstitious. Episode 13. <laughs> Episode 13. Coming at you full of glitches. Yeah. We should talk to them at some point about that Louis Armstrong song. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe... Maybe in a week or two for Christmas time, right? That is not a Christmas song. No, I guess it's not. You know what, though? When I think of that genre of music, I think of Christmas in cafes and cold weather. And he's one of the people that makes me think of Christmas time. And maybe it's because we were Christmas shopping when we... <laughs> if you guys want a really funny laugh, look up the song by Louis Armstrong, <laughs> A me. Fine Romance. Okay? Because we were listening to a jazz uh, station one day. Yep. With Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong sing a song of fine it's this romance. Beautiful song, and he's got beautiful. his thing going, and then he says a word, and we're like, "Did he?" Just he's like say in the middle of the song. <laughs> he's like rhyming, you know. It's like two lines of fine romance, blah blah blah. Right. And the reason we're bringing this up right now is because he uses the word glitches, glitches. in and the song. He's like a fine romance yeah. with no glitches, yeah, and then yeah. he says, and then the next line is a fine romance with no. You tell me what rhymes with that word, and yeah, Louis Armstrong, what a wonderful world, says He's that so word. He's so I said, can't believe he said that. We both looked at each other in the car like, did he just say bitches? And he did. <laughs> Your life has changed when you hear Louis Armstrong When you hear Armstrong Louis Armstrong say that one. bitches. <laughs> just like, what? <laughs> so, anyway. Anyway, all right, yeah. people. We'll see you next week. Yes. Thanks for coming. Yeah, cheers. And, uh, oh, cheers. Cheers. Woohoo. Woohoo. Okay, take care. <laughs>